yours. Fun to watch. Minus 15. Respect all, fear none. Into the upper deck. Intensity is not a perfume. Hello, Utah Street! Five, four, three, two, one. From inside our two-bedroom apartment in downtown Baltimore, it is the Masson All Access Podcast. Paul Mancano, Brendan Mortensen, live on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. Perhaps you're listening to us after the fact on any of your chosen podcast platforms. Thank you so much for tuning in. We are about a week into spring training down in Sarasota, Florida. Beautiful, sunny Sarasota, Florida a place we do not occupy at the moment. We are currently in gray and cloudy, overcast Baltimore. Brendan, what was your favorite moment of the week? I'll stop you right there. Mine was the 30 <laughs> seconds over the weekend we got to see the sun. It was incredible. It was There was there was 30 seconds. 30 full seconds and I I wow. you know, I took out the tanning, you know, bed and I I said this is the life. You know, yeah. this is how I'm sure they must live down in Sarasota, Florida, because, yeah. uh, you know, it was amazing, those 30 seconds. My other favorite 30 seconds was mm. when it snowed before it turned into icy, freezing rain and uh, sleet. So, you know. Just general grayness. Grayness, outside. Yeah. yeah. Grayness and and ice and just all the fun things that we enjoy. That, those are the best parts of weather. Well, it's basically know? like being in Sarasota. Yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah. I'm it, sure they're experiencing the same cold. On a day to day basis. Yeah. The the weather has to be exactly the same. I would agree. It's brutal. Yeah. It's brutal. And I didn't it think is. I was gonna start this podcast by talking about the weather, but Brendan, it is it is it is incredibly brutal. Outside. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we got a lot to talk about here on this podcast today. We're gonna be going through our roster predictions, our twenty six Man opening day roster predictions, and then I got a stupid little game for us to play later on, Brendan. Oh, you always have stupid little games. That's exciting. Not always. Well, sometimes. Uh, sometimes. Sometimes. Um, so thank you so much for tuning in. Let's get to the headlines first and foremost. We need like a newsman, kind of like dun 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 dun. Yeah, like today's a headlines. News ticker. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we don't have it. Uh, we don't. Production value low, <laughs> as evidenced by our kitchen. Uh, Whoa! <laughs> Look, Weird I did the dishes shot at yesterday. our own kitchen. All right, I'll tell you. Uh, anyway, headlines yes. for the first week of, of of spring training. First and foremost, it was expected. It's not a shock, but it does not lessen the impact of the arrival of Trey Mancini to Orioles spring training camp. Just an awesome sight to see him yesterday. He's been there since February first. He has been working out with the team since the very first day it was possible down at the Ed Smith Stadium Complex. Uh, and yesterday he met with the reporters for the first time. Sounded ready to go. Sounded like yeah. he has been itching to play since the time that he has been shelved after the uh, diagnosis he got almost a year ago. Yeah. It, he said in his press conference yesterday that it seems like no matter how many times he tells people he still has to remind people that he's feeling 100% and good to go because it's almost, well, it is. It, it's remarkable that Trey Mancini is back and feeling as good as he is and is swinging the bat the same way and, and playing like Trey Mancini that we know. It's incredible. Yeah. And it's, look, the Orioles might have a 0.0% chance of making the playoffs, according to fan graphs, a 100% chance of wholesomeness when Trey Mancini returns. Uh, bringing some smiles. Yes. To, uh... You know, to, and he says he does want to play in the spring training exhibition opener, which is just five days away, believe it or not. Yeah. Uh, no matter where he plays, whether he just DHs, plays first base, maybe plays the outfield. Um, but I don't know exactly how much he'll be used this spring because I'm sure that Brandon Hyde will want to ease him back into things. But I'm sure that we will, uh, if everything goes according to plan, and he's certainly on track, we will see him opening day up at Fenway. Then we'll see him a week later at Oreo Park at Camden Yards for the home opener, which is also exciting. Yeah, I mean, there's no need to push it. Later on in the podcast, we're going to talk about some guys that are going to be fighting for roster spots on the opening day roster. Trey Mancini does not fall under that category. No, Trey Mancini not. is a lock to make the team, so you just want to get him back into shape, back into playing form, and whatever form that takes. 
the Orioles are going to do whatever is best for him. They're not going to push him in spring training. Yeah. Other than that, in terms of headlines, not too much kind of breaking news. Uh, everybody, for the most part, has reported on time. No health issues, which is really amazing yeah. at this point. Um, and I think that that's a, a great sign and, and shows you a little bit more about how this team, uh, a lot of the players on this team have been taking this thing seriously really since last year, since this time last year, um, and making sure that they are not taking any unnecessary risks and they're ready to go for spring training. So that's all good news as well. We have gotten a, some glimmers from Brandon Hyde and some idea of what this roster could look like uh, as it takes shape over the next five or so weeks before that April 1st opening day up at, at Fenway Park. He isn't giving away a whole lot, and I think that so much is going to be revealed in the games once those get started as well. Uh, but we can kind of get some ideas of what we think this roster might, might look like. Now, in terms of comparison's sake, we can't really look at last year's roster as an example, last year's opening day roster, because if you remember, it started out at a gargantuan 30 players. Right. And then two years ago, which was Brandon Hyde's first year as manager, it was 25 players. So we now have a 26-man opening day roster for the first time. And it's tough to tell which players are going to be in which spots because you are going into, I'm not going to use the word unprecedented, that's my least favorite word, for the past year, you're going into a season in which the all of the players have played fewer games last year. The minor leaguers had no season to speak of. Um, and the major leaguers had a weird time off to stay in shape before they got the season started. So it's going to be difficult to determine how the Orioles want to uh, use their pitchers considering they had such a weird season in 2020. Yeah. It, what makes it even more weird with the pitchers in 2020 is that a lot of them, like you need to ramp up their workload a lot for yeah. the 2020 season. You didn't have guys starting more than what? 10, 11 games for the Orioles in 2020 and looking ahead to this season. Are you really going to ask a pitcher? I mean, you're going to have to more than likely to start 25 games after a season in which they just started 10 or 11? Yeah. We don't really know. So there's a possibility that the Orioles could go with a six-man rotation. We've both tossed that idea around. They could carry as many as 14 pitchers. We've seen that number get tossed around as well. So it's really hard to tell what the O's might do because of how weird the transition from the 2020 to the 2021 season looks like. And in terms of whether they could use 14 pitchers, Brandon Hyde addressed that the other day when speaking with the media, giving us a little bit of glimpse into how versatility, talked about how versatility on the roster is important, not just in terms of position players, but also pitchers, being able to go back and forth between the rotation and the bullpen. Here was Hyde yesterday. Well, definitely if we go with 14 pitchers, there's no doubt about it. The more pitchers you have, the more versatility we're going to need from our position players. Uh, but yeah, I think that, you know, we're, we're, we're entering a season unlike any other that we've entered and that the, the season was so short last year. Um, so I think there's so many question marks regarding um, pitchers, pitch, pitch usage, how much, um, you know, how pitchers are going to react for a, during a six month season after an interrupted season last year. Um, so I think versatility on the mound, guys are going to be able to cover your innings as well as versatility on the, on the field guys being able to play in multiple positions because you might be pitcher heavy um, on your roster at, at, during during times during during the season. So guys that can play multiple positions are, are always there at, at a premium, um, but even, even more so this year. So we don't want to read too much into every word that Brandon Hyde is going to say, probably because at this point he doesn't even know exactly what the roster is going to look like in five weeks. But Brendan, he mentioned the versatility being important for the position players and also the versatility being important for the pitchers being able to go back and forth between the rotation and the bullpen. That might give us a little bit of clarity as we try to make our 26-man roster predictions. Yeah, and there's a bunch of pitchers on this roster right now that have the ability to both be a starter and be a reliever. And you would have to think that those guys probably have a leg up on some of the other guys yeah. battling for roster spots 
that are specifically a starter or specifically a reliever. Somebody like Fernando Abad comes to mind because he's probably not going to be a starter at any point during the season, which limits his usage for 2021. Would you rather have somebody like Jorge Lopez or Thomas Eshelman than Fernando Abad who can start a game and maybe go four or five innings? Yeah. We know Abad can't do that more than likely. And by the same token, when it comes to the uh, position players, somebody like a Pat Vileka, who played just about every position last year for the O's, probably has a leg up on somebody who is strictly viewed as one position. I think of DJ Stewart right. being a just an outfielder. You can't really throw him at, maybe you could throw him at first base if you absolutely needed to. But other than that, he's an outfielder. Pat Vileka can play in the outfield if need be, can play shortstop, can play second, can play first. So he might have a, a leg up as a utility guy. But let's get into our 26-man opening day roster predictions going in with the limited information that we have and a lot of our own guesswork. Brendan, let's start with your 26-man. First, for I mean, the, the most important question here, how many pitchers versus position players do you have on this team? So I've got 13 pitchers and 13 position players Okay, on the 26th. The number 14 for pitchers has been tossed around a lot. I just don't see how you go 14 pitchers. It's a lot. It really limits what you can do on the bench. So obviously there's some locks on this roster that we don't really need to talk about. Means, Kramer, Aiken for pitchers, uh, starters that is, for relievers, Paul Fry, Armstrong, yeah. Lakins, Harvey, Scott. I mean, heck, all of those guys kind of seem like locks. Uh, yeah, Paul Fry, Sean Armstrong, Travis Lakins, Hunter Harvey, Dylan Tate, Tanner Scott, and Cesar Valdez. They're think, making the team. I think you could say all of those guys make the team. Yeah. Um, unless the only way one of those guys does not, in my mind, is, well, one, injury. I mean, odds are, over the next five weeks, unfortunately, some injury will befall one of these 26 guys that we are going to list. Yes. So we're probably not going to get it right just based on the fact that there's probably going to be some kind of injury in camp that we can't predict at this point. Might keep somebody off the opening day roster. They might be on the IL to start the season. So there, there's one scenario. The other scenario, I think, is the only one is if one of these guys gets traded. Right. And, and I think at this point, it's possible. The closer we get to opening day, it's probably less and less likely that one of these seven guys that we just mentioned in the bullpen gets traded. But I think that you could make a case that all seven of these guys could maybe be trade assets. Right. Maybe they hold on to Dylan Tate and Hunter Harvey and Tanner Scott because they're a little bit younger, but probably would want to move on from... Armstrong, Fry, Lakins, or Valdez if they had the right deal in right. place. But I, I don't think they're going to get a good enough offer before opening day to deal one of these guys. Right. So I'll stick with the pitcher side for now. I think those seven relievers are pretty much a lock for the opening day roster unless somehow they get traded before the season, which I don't really see happening. The starting pitchers gets interesting towards the bottom. The Felix Hernandez, Matt Harvey, Wade LeBlanc. I'm pretty confident that Felix Hernandez makes the opening day roster. I think his stuff over his career is just too good not to show enough flashes in spring training for him to crack the opening day starting five. Matt Harvey and Wade LeBlanc, I think, are more interesting. I think there's going to be a pretty solid battle between Matt Harvey, Wade LeBlanc, Bruce Zimmerman, Jorge Lopez, and Thomas Eshelman. Yeah. Those are the guys that I am foreseeing taking up two or maybe three of the final pitcher spots on the Orioles roster. I'm giving the edge to Harvey and LeBlanc for experience rather than somebody like Bruce Zimmerman. And I think their stuff is just better than Jorge Lopez and Thomas Eshelman. I know Eshelman was solid last year, but I think at least out of spring training, I would give the edge to guys who have historically pitched better over their careers. And so that's why I went Harvey and LeBlanc. And real quick, I made an error on the graphic. Uh, thanks to no one. Our comments are pointing out Tanner Scott's a lefty. Had him down as yes. a righty. That has happened so many times in this podcast. <laughs> and that, I apologize for that. Yeah. Um, yes. So that, that starter battle, I think, is going to be fascinating. I think there are a couple factors in play there, Brendan. The fact that both Felix Hernandez and Matt Harvey... And Wade LeBlanc, all three of those guys are on minor league deals. Right. Thomas Eshelman is on a minor league deal. But Hernandez and Harvey in particular, from reports, get a million dollars if they make the team. Do the Orioles right. want to keep both of those guys 
and pay them each a million dollars, whereas if they kept somebody like an Eshelman and cut one of those two guys, they would be able to save themselves some money. That's, yeah. that's a factor. Um, I don't know how big of a factor it is, and I think the Orioles would gladly pay those million dollars to those players if they thought that they could keep them long enough and they could perform well enough that they could flip one or both of those guys. Right, I, and I think that's probably why they crack the opening day roster is if Harvey and LeBlanc look decent in spring training, I think both of them are trade candidates. Yeah. More so than somebody like Jorge Lopez and Thomas Eshelman. And I, I'm pretty sure if you're Michael Elias at this point, you are going to want to maximize the potential trade value you can get out of these pitchers that probably aren't going to stick around very long. Yeah. So you have 13 pitchers. Six yep. of them are starters. You have seven relievers. Yeah. Position players. You have two catchers. Yes. I think that's pretty much a lock. Yep. But Severino and Cisco are pretty much locks. I think that that number is going to stay at two. I don't think that they're going to add anybody else. I don't think... Austin wins will make this team. He didn't play in a single game last year. Yeah. I think it's going to be two catchers. And there will be a catcher on the taxi squad. Probably. Assuming, I'm guessing they're doing a taxi squad this year. I think they are. I can't say for sure. I think the reason they did the taxi squad last year was mostly because of the concerns that they had that somebody might have to drop out right before a game. Right. I don't know if they're going to do that this year. Well, we'll see. Honest. We'll maybe, maybe, maybe there will be a catcher on a potential taxi squad. Yeah. You, it's always good to have an emergency yeah. catcher. So that leaves uh, how many guys in your infield, how many guys in your outfield? So infielders, we've got Trey Mancini as a lock. Yolmer Sanchez, I don't think started the year as a lock, but after some of the moves that the Orioles have made or lack of moves going out and signing another second baseman or a shortstop and, of course, not re-signing Hans Herr Alberto, I think Yolmer Sanchez is pretty much a lock to make this team. If not at, as the starting second baseman, as a versatile guy who can play second or third. Yeah. Rio Ruiz, I was a little bit on the fence about. I think Rio Ruiz needs to have a pretty good spring training, but I still think he makes the team. And then Galvis and Davis are locks. Pat Valeka, I think he makes it um, over somebody like Jemai Jones or Ramon Urias. I wanted so badly to put Jemai Jones on this opening day roster, but given the fact that he was acquired so recently... I just think the Orioles will probably want to keep him in AAA for at least a little while, but I think Jemai Jones will get a call pretty quickly in the infield. Yeah, I agree in terms of the locks. Trey Mancini, Yolmer Sanchez. I do think Rio Ruiz, despite the fact that he was not phenomenal last year, I do think he is about as close to a lock as you can get. Galvis, absolutely, is going to be your opening day shortstop. Chris Davis, absolutely. I also, and we'll get to my roster in a bit, but... yeah. If you, if you were to read extra <laughs> into that Brandon Hyde clip that we just played where he talked about versatility, I think you could make a legitimate case that Jemai Jones might have a leg up over yeah. some of the other candidates Because you could there. put him in center field. Because you can put him in center, you can put him in a corner outfield, maybe if you needed to, and you, of course, they view him particularly as a second baseman. Right. So that would, you know, make Yolmer Sanchez. You could move him around the, the infield, maybe put him at third. They've talked about putting him at short if you had Jemai at second. The thing, though, with Jemai Jones, Brendan, is he only played in those, what, he got those seven at-bats last year with the Angels. We don't know if the Orioles view him as major league ready at this point. And would you really want to bring up a guy who's viewed as one of the higher prospects in your system to not be an everyday starter? Because if you add him to your opening right. day roster with this current construction where you have Sanchez at second, Rio Ruiz at third, Freddie Galvis at short, you're probably going to have Jemai Jones on your bench as a utility guy. Maybe you could give Rio Ruiz days off. You move Yolmer Sanchez to third, and you have Jemai Jones at second. But I think if they're going to bring up Jemai Jones, I think it's more likely that they're going to give him a shot to start every day and see if he has it. Otherwise, I, it, it is possible they could use him as a utility guy. I just think that that's probably where they most likely see him. Right. And, and that's if they see him as major league ready. I think if Jemai Jones is on the team, he's your starting second baseman. Probably. Probably. Yeah. Uh, because I think they want to they see what he has. Right. And then looking to the outfield, Austin Hayes, Ryan Mountcastle, Cedric Mullins even I think is pretty much a lock, and Anthony Santander. I think the last position battle there is between Ryan McKenna, DJ Stewart, and Yusniel Diaz. Yeah. I gave the edge here to Ryan McKenna. 
I don't know realistically if that is going to happen, but I don't know. I, DJ Stewart has had a ton of opportunities at the major league level, and I think maybe it's time to make a switch there. Ryan McKenna is really good defensively. I know he doesn't have the best bat, but he can play center if Mullins or Austin Hayes is shifted over to one of the corner outfields. I don't know. I, I just give the edge to Ryan McKenna here. I think he has a good spring training and impresses enough where he might be the guy. I don't think that he makes the team out of camp, and that's that's where I would I would disagree. I think Ryan McKenna is going to make this team at some point during the season. He's going to get a call up. I don't think it's going to be on opening day because DJ Stewart currently has one option left. And what we've seen from this uh, coaching staff and, and a Michael Eyes for led front office is they're more likely to give a, an experienced guy the opening day nod and let him try to hold on to the job and hold off a younger guy. Right. And if he's not able to, then they send him back down. We saw it in 2019 with Cedric Mullins. Started the season at the big league level, really struggled, hit like 088. They sent him back down to the minors. He eventually worked his way back up. They did it last year with Cedric Mullins. He made the opening day roster, was sent back down after he struggled, came back up. I think the same thing is going to happen with DJ Stewart this year. I think that he is going to make the opening day roster. They're going to give him one more shot to try to make this team and to try to um, make that one phenomenal week in entire season that he had last year. If he struggles, it'll be a quick hook. If he struggles, I could see him them sending him down and maybe use Neil Diaz, I think, would even get the call up before Ryan McKenna. But I think that th both those guys are roughly on the same level. They both played at the AA level in 2019. They were both at the alternate site. In fact, McKenna was, was on the taxi squad for much of the 2020 season. Um, but I think that they're going to give DJ Stewart, former first-round pick, one more shot to kind of maximize his potential. And if he struggles in the first month of the season, they'll use that final option on DJ Stewart. They'll send him back down to Norfolk, and they will give Ryan McKenna or use Neil Diaz a shot. Yeah, I, I agree. I think DJ Stewart might get a shot, but I think the difference between this year and a few years ago, you mentioned an example like Cedric Mullins, there are more prospects banging on the door right now than there were before. There are. And I don't know if you can... I, I, I know you can probably afford to give DJ Stewart one more shot, but I don't know. We we're talking about guys like DJ Stewart and Rio Ruiz. Rio Ruiz I have making the roster, DJ Stewart I don't. We've talked about them for a bunch of podcasts being the two guys that have had a bunch of opportunities and their their time to take advantage of them is really running out. And I think DJ Stewart, there are just too many good outfield prospects in the Orioles system right now and I don't know if continuing to play DJ Stewart is really justified at this point. When you've got McKenna, who is so versatile in the outfield, you would think. I mean, he's a good defender, and he can play a solid center field, yeah. which makes me think at least that he can play a solid left and right field as well because center field is the harder outfield position to play. And then Yusniel Diaz, who at one point was the Orioles' top prospect, is still a very good right field prospect and will probably end up being better than DJ Stewart if everything goes to plan. I just don't know how you continue to justify putting DJ Stewart on the team. I think you could say that a month into the season if he really starts to struggle. Yes. But I think I also think 2020 being a strange season, if 2020 were a normal season, DJ Stewart's time might have already run out at this point because we might have already seen what those younger guys can do. But I think especially considering they didn't get a full season's worth of at-bats last year, uh, I'm talking about uh, Diaz and, and McKenna. You know, they were kind of uh, stuck at the buoy site, and that was really only for a couple months. <laughs> I think that they're going to just get those guys up back 100%, see if DJ Stewart can hold on to the spot. And it's not like you look at that outfield. I mean, you, want your, you always want your fourth outfielder to be kind of the backup center fielder in some ways because you want him to, to be – typically teams use their fourth outfielder spot and somebody who is glove first and somebody who is mostly a center fielder. That fits the Cedric Mullins bill. DJ Stewart, I think – makes a little bit more sense than a Ryan McKenna because McKenna, to me, would be more of a defensive replacement. Um, probably you're not going to expect a whole lot from his bat to start his big league career. You would expect more from his glove. DJ Stewart, this team doesn't currently really have a DH set in place. 
And when we talked about the lineups a, a couple weeks ago, we a lot of us inserted uh, in a lot of our lineups, we had DJ Stewart in there as your right. opening day DH. So I think DJ Stewart just makes more sense to start the year. That being said, quick hook if he, if he yep. does not show himself. Yeah, I think we can agree here, Paul, that if DJ Stewart does make the team – This is it. I mean, this is the shot for DJ Stewart to prove that he needs to be on the Orioles roster. And if this isn't the season for him, I don't think there is going to be one. And uh, people are commenting also about Chance Sisko maybe being your DH. uh, Brandon Hyde is going to use that DH spot as a rotating cast of characters. I think DJ is going to get some opportunities. I do think they they did it last year a little bit where they had one catcher catch the other DH. Ryan Mountcastle is going to get some time at DH. And Trey Mancini, I do think, is going to be your DH at times. Now, Paul, here's a question for you. Give it to me. Right now, we have, both of us have five outfielders. We differed on uh, Ryan McKenna versus DJ Stewart on your roster. As we pull up yours, and it looks exactly the same. It's almost exactly the same. Except for you've swapped in DJ Stewart instead of Ryan McKenna. Yeah. My question for you, Paul. Give it to me. Is... That's five outfielders. Yeah. We know that the Orioles probably could roll with four, but I put five because I think Ryan Mountcastle will get some games at first, and I think Cedric Mullins will probably end up starting more than he ends up being the fourth outfielder. Well, and in 2019, the last time we had a somewhat regular roster, they went with four outfielders to start the season, but they also had one fewer roster spot. Right. So my question for you, Paul, is... What are the odds the Orioles, instead of five outfielders, instead go with a another infielder? Maybe yep. a Jemai Jones who can play second base, and maybe you can throw him out in center field. Yeah, I think that that's where you could envision Jemai Jones. And and if you if you really look for versatility, if that's really what they're looking for, because they're going to have so few spots on the bench. I mean, really, you look at the the way if they go with thirteen pitchers. They are still really only going to have a backup catcher, backup first baseman in Chris Davis, a utility guy in Pat Vileka, and one extra, uh, uh, you know, Cedric Mullins is your fourth outfielder, and one extra guy. So they're not going to have, Brandon Ide is not going to have a whole lot of, and that's if they go with 13 pitchers, not 14. If they go with 14 pitchers, they're going to have four guys, really, that they can rotate into those other spots. And that's just not ideal when you're trying to get through games. Um so I think that there's a chance. That being said, I think that whoever shows himself as being the best player, uh, and, and again, injuries could change this. Injuries are probably going to change what this opening day lineup is going to look like. Maybe somebody gets hurt, and maybe Jemai Jones is able to sl- sneak his way onto the opening day roster, or McKenna, um, or a- even Diaz maybe. Right. But I think that I do think that if everybody stays healthy, they're probably going to keep Jemai Jones at the AAA level to start the year. Yeah, we have a question from Eric on Facebook. Says, will Richie Martin be on the DL? Richie Martin probably, well, he won't be on the opening day roster, we are assuming. But we talked about a little bit the fact that even if Richie Martin was healthy and ready to go, from the sounds of things, it kind of sounds like Mike Elias has planned to have Richie Martin be at least at the AAA level because he was kind of thrown into the fire a little bit too early at the major league level and they want to get him some more reps in the minors before calling him back up to the major leagues yeah I think even going back to the winter meetings in 2019 uh, back in San Diego forever ago uh, Richie Martin was talked about as starting the season at AAA Mike Elias was kind of hinting at the fact that they wanted to give him every day at bats at the AAA level because he never got to, he's never played a game at AAA yeah. before. Um, and now that he has the broken hamate bone, this kind of gives him a built-in excuse to start the the year at the AAA level. Yeah, so, and he he would not be starting over Freddie Galvis. No, no I, they made that clear. He would only him. be a rotational shortstop yeah. and maybe occasionally play some second base, but I think the AAA reps for Richie Martin would be much more valuable. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to the rotation and the bullpen real quick, Brandon. Yeah, let's do it. Um, because there are so many guys, the Orioles for the last few years under Michael Elias have brought in a million guys, million pitchers to try to make their way onto the opening day roster. The fact that they have Hernandez, Harvey, and LeBlanc all signed to minor league deals, all veterans, and more starters than relievers of those three guys. I don't know. I mean, it, it, there are so many names that are going to have just missed the cut. Ashelman, uh, 
Max Roller, Tyler Wells, your two Rule 5 guys, do you really want to drop both of those guys after you lost two guys in the Rule 5 draft, too? You might have to. I, 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 don't we see, I don't see where they fit. Yeah, we can't find a spot for them, which is yeah. a good thing, and that speaks to the development of a lot of the bullpen arms. I mean, in previous years, you know, maybe Armstrong or Tate or, you know, Harvey might be not close to making the roster, but the fact that all of these guys, the seven guys that we mentioned, have all kind of proven themselves. Right. Um, you can't justify keeping a, a Rule 5 pick over somebody like a Sean Armstrong or a Paul Fry or a Travis Lakins, right. given the season that they just had in 2020. Well, truthfully, those two Rule 5 guys didn't factor into my decision too awful much because there's just too many other pitchers that you would probably rather yeah. have than a Rule 5 guy who hasn't pitched at the majors. Yeah. I mean, we both have Matt Harvey and Wade LeBlanc making the roster, but that leaves off Bruce Zimmerman, Jorge Lopez, Thomas Eshelman, and Fernando Abad are probably the four big names yeah. that get left off the roster at that point. I don't think the two Rule 5 guys are in that category of four of potential guys that could make the roster. I just don't see it. Yeah, and again, injuries could change things, but I... I tend to agree with you. Yeah. And in terms of the rotation to start the season, Brandon Hyde has said he could see them going with a six-man rotation. Yep. I think there's a good chance at times during the season they go with six guys because, mm -hmm. like you said off the top, are we really? do they really feel comfortable giving Dean Kramer and Keegan Aiken 25 to 30 starts a year after they – we're at the alternate site and then only made four starts or five starts right. last year. That's just a lot to put, especially on these young guys' shoulders. Um, so I think that I, for the time being, I have six starters in that rotation with Wade LeBlanc, but I also think that if, if Brandon Hyde wants to go with a five-man rotation to start the year, I could see them using Matt Harvey in the bullpen because he was used in the bullpen last year with Kansas yeah. City. So, But I do think between... I do think both all of Felix Hernandez, Matt Harvey, and Wade LeBlanc made the, make the team. Yes, I, I agree with you there, and I think it's also entirely possible that it's not a traditional six-man rotation. Or five-man. <laughs> or, yeah. or even a five-man. I think maybe it, it could be a five-and-a-half-man rotation where Wade LeBlanc makes some spot starts yeah. here and there, or maybe Harvey is the sixth man, who knows. But I think you will probably see... Within the few, first few weeks of the season, I think it's entirely possible that you see six or seven guys make starts for the Orioles. Yeah. Let's not forget about Cesar Valdez, who will probably be an innings eater. I, I cannot imagine him in a similar right. closer role uh, as he was last year. I think Cesar Valdez could end up as a spot starter yeah. here and there. Well, that's and that's why I think maybe Jorge Lopez could yeah. sneak his way onto the team. Yep. And if you take away... Maybe DJ Stewart's the odd man out. They use that final option. They send him down to AAA to start the year. And maybe you do go 14 pitchers. And you pitchers. go 14 pitchers. Yeah. There are a lot of, a lot of different intriguing things. position battles. Yeah. I mean, you look at the outfield. It's going to be Usniel Diaz, DJ Stewart, Ryan McKenna, and Cedric Mullins. Two of those guys I have making the roster. Yeah. Maybe even just one of those guys makes the roster. In the infield, you've got Jemai Jones, Pat Valeka, and Ramon Urias. I think probably only one of those guys makes the roster. And then, like I said before with the pitchers, Matt Harvey, Wade LeBlanc, Bruce Zimmerman, Jorge Lopez, Thomas Eshelman, and Fernando Abad. Two or three of those guys are making the roster. Yeah. All of them have solid cases. Yeah, and there is I do think that there is a chance that we could see a surprise cut from yep. uh, Felix Hernandez, Matt Harvey, Wade LeBlanc. Again, don't think it's going to happen, but I think there's a chance. I think of the three of them, I would I would say Hernandez has the best chance to of make the roster. the roster. Yes, I would agree. Uh, Harvey and LeBlanc, I would probably say, have the highest chance of being surprise cuts. I could see, I think LeBlanc, they each have a case. I think Harvey has the edge because he could definitely be used out of the bullpen, and he obviously has the name and the track record. LeBlanc has a slight edge, I think, because he's a lefty. And when we go through that seven-man bullpen that we did, the right. only two lefties currently locked in are Paul Fry and Tanner Scott. Yes. So Wade LeBlanc being used as a innings eater, lefty, out of the bullpen, or a spot starter could help him. Right. But Matt Harvey's Matt Harvey. 
Yeah, Randy on <laughs> Facebook says he doesn't see LeBlanc or Harvey making the roster when there are so many talented young guys. We're not really factoring in Michael Bauman and Zach Lowther at this point. Yeah. I don't think either of them make the opening day roster. I'd agree. For the O's, I think they will probably use a little bit more time in AAA. I think there's a chance that they really impress in spring training and Brandon Hyde and Michael Elias say, wow, maybe we need to get them up sooner than we planned for initially. But I just don't think they make the opening day roster. Yeah. Uh, that, I think they get called up pretty soon. That's kind of a good transition to uh, Stupid Little Game. Do you want to get into Ooh. Stupid Little Game real quick? Let's do Stupid Little Game. It's uh, kind of a continuation of our ros- roster talk. And by the way, file away those 26-man roster re- predictions and feel free to call us idiots in five weeks when we are totally and yes. completely incorrect. <laughs> and the Orioles end up cutting Felix Hernandez and Matt Harvey and Wade LeBlanc. And they start Bruce Zimmerman as their number <laughs> they four. Start Bruce Zimmerman as their four. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, DJ Stewart uh, is their opening day right fielder. No. Yeah. Uh, all right. I'm going to... This, this is a fun little birds game. I'm going to incorporate Ooh. birds. Imagine that you have 100 birds to give out, Brendan. Okay. And I'm going to give you a bunch of scenarios, and you put a number of birds on each scenario. The most birds on the thing that you think is most likely, second most likely, and final. So, like, percentage-wise. Okay. So, like, you think an outcome... I give you three outcomes. You think one is the most likely... But how, you know... How many... Gonna, okay. Typically, Got they're going to have three outcomes for these sure. things. It's a, it's a stupid game, all right? I'm <laughs> setting the expectations low here. Yeah. It's a percentage. I can, I can only you be pleasantly surprised at this point. All right. Oh, I got it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. These okay. are mostly predictions for the 2021 season. We'll okay. Start with Adley Rutschman. Okay. All right. Three outcomes for you. Adley Rutschman debuts before July 31st. Adley Rutschman debuts after July 31st. Adley okay. Rutschman does not debut in 2021. Um, I am putting zero of my birds Z- on... You have to put some birds. I will put two birds okay. on Adley Rutschman does not debut in 2021. Okay. I think there is an incredibly high chance that Adley Rutschman but debuts you're not, you're in 2021. you're also not factoring in injuries. I mean, there, you know... Right, that's... Okay, so uh, f- for that, I will put... Think about game theory here, Brendan. Okay, fine. I will put <laughs> two birds on Adley Rutschman. Okay. De- fine. Five you think birds. there's a 98% chance that he makes his debut this year? 98? Five birds, Paul. Okay. Five birds on fine. Adley Rutschman not making his debut in 2021. July 31st was the date you gave yeah, me? Yes, so before or after. <sighs> okay. I put... I, I picked July 31st because maybe some trades could open up some roster spots. Okay. I put... 65 birds on Adley Rutschman's debut after July 31st. Okay. And then 30 remaining birds on the Adley Rutschman before July 31st. Okay. I, I don't think they rush him, they but rush I also him? think he gets called up at some point in 2021. The final answer. What did I have? 65 <laughs> birds. I don't know. 65 Somebody birds write this down after 2021, or uh, after July 31st. Five birds <laughs> that he doesn't debut at all, and 30 birds before July 31st. The best part about this is it not only is it a stupid game, but it's confusing as well. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> a great game here. All Paul. right. Uh, next up, Felix Hernandez. Three yeah. outcomes for you. Okay. One makes the team and is traded during the 2021 season. One million birds. <laughs> There's a cap here. <laughs> birds. Dang okay. It. Okay. Uh, Two, makes the team but is not traded. Zero birds. (laughs) And three, does not make the team. Okay. I will put 10 birds on Felix Hernandez not making the team. I will put another 10 birds on Felix Hernandez making the team and not getting traded because that's... uh, I'll put 20 birds on that. (laughs) 20 birds on Felix Hernandez... Making the team it's and not getting traded. Skills. That's the best part about it. Yeah, I, believe it or not, I was an analytics minor in college. You would not guess it from my current math skills that mm-hmm. I'm displaying. 20 birds on Felix Hernandez making the team but not getting traded, okay. which would basically assume that he stinks. Maybe when he not. Makes I mean, majors. Either either he's okay and teams just don't buy into his success. See, I think if Felix Hernandez or, is okay, he still gets traded. Or he's injured. Right. Or he does stink and they have to cut him. Yeah. 
So I, I've I think got those 20 th- birds on that. You know, those are three outcomes. Yeah, how likely those are within that outcome, though. You know? uh, I will put my remaining 70 birds. Let's get a diagram in. On Felix Hernandez. We should get a pie chart. Nice little and we yeah. put birds over there. 70 birds, birds. on Felix Hernandez birds making pie. the team and getting traded. Because I, <laughs> as you know, am incredibly optimistic about Felix Hernandez. I think he's going to be good this season. He's your new Cedric Mullins. That's he is right. my new Cedric Mullins. This is a Cedric Mullins and Felix Hernandez stand account. Please follow it on Twitter. Um, I, I think Felix Hernandez makes the team and is pretty good. And if he is pretty good, then he gets traded for prospects. All right. I'm glad you worked through that, Brendan. Thank you. Uh, Me too. <laughs> All right. Another outcome for you. Okay. Two, actually, this is just, is just a, a 50-50 here. Thing. Ooh. The only two outcomes. Who pitches more innings for the Orioles in 2021? Okay. Hunter Harvey Ooh. or Matt Harvey? So here, Ooh, the, okay. th- the things involved here. See, that's interesting because Hunter Harvey, in his Orioles career, has pitched a shockingly low number of innings. I wouldn't say it's shockingly low. But it is it's, a surprise. It seems thing. low. Considering the crazy injury history that he has had. Right. Uh, for him to even make his debut at all, I think was uh If I had to guess right thing. now without without looking at it, without cheating on Paul's computer, I would guess that he has pitched somewhere between, between 10 and 20 innings for the Orioles. 10 and 20. Yes, you are correct. He has pitched in... What's... He's pitching 15, directly between 10 wow. and 20 innings. Bang. Yeah. Um, so Hunter Harvey, I'm, I am hoping that Hunter Harvey, if all things are good, if he stays healthy, I think Hunter Harvey has a pretty good chance to be the Orioles' closer for this year. However, yeah, Hunter, uh, yeah, Hunter Harvey, get my Harveys mixed up here. That's Matt Harvey. It's a confusing. It's a confusing game that doesn't make sense, Paul. I think Matt Harvey probably only has to make a few starts to surpass Hunter Harvey, right? But if Hunter Harvey is healthy. If Hunter Harvey is healthy and is your closer for the season, oh, man, this is tough. I think it's I think it's incredibly unlikely he pitches 60 or more innings. I think it's yes. unlikely he pitches 50 or more innings. So, okay, I don't have I'm to pick one Hunter or the right? other. This is my, this is my yeah, bird yeah, birds, game. Birds in, bird yeah. game. All right, I am going... Bird in the hand. Oh boy! Should have I'm it going bird in the hand. seventy birds. Matt Harvey pitches more innings. Whoa! All right. Thirty birds. Hunter Harvey pitches more innings. I would have gone reversed personally because wow. I think that there's because I think that there's a one hundred percent chance that Hunter Harvey makes the team. Yes. I think there's a ninety percent chance Matt Harvey makes. The now team. you're making me a second guess myself. Sixty birds to Matt Harvey. It is the birds were not locked. Pi in. times seven, of right. course, divided by eight. Right. That equals your number of birds. Sure. Uh, 60 birds, Matt Harvey. 40 birds, Hunter Harvey. Final answer. All right. Fair enough. Okay, two more. Two more birds. Let's get this over with. (laughs) Uh, I think everyone hates it, so we should just skate right Oh, me included now. I I regret this. Yeah. Uh, Michael Bauman is, 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 is the player we're discussing here. Okay. Number of birds that he debuts before Zach Lowther. Ooh. After Zach Lowther. Or neither debuts in 2021. I will put five birds on Michael Bauman not debuting in 2021. Wow, okay. I think Michael Bauman is even more so of a lock than Zach Lowther to debut this season. Okay. Mm, I think we've always... T- this one's funny because we always talk about those two as a pair. Yeah. We don't really talk them about them that much individually well, because they're kind of grouped together as they're going to debut around the same time. They and are... And Alexander Wells. You can they are that. a similar ranking in the Orioles farm system according yeah. to MOB Pipeline. So we've kind of bunched them together and we haven't really looked at where they might debut individually. Michael Bauman, I believe, is a year older, right? He is a little bit older. I don't know if he's a full year. He's a little bit older than Zach Lowther. So I think I think he probably debuts before Zach Lowther. So okay. I had five birds on Michael Bauman not debuting at all. I will put 65 birds on Michael Bauman debuting before Zach Lowther and 30 birds on him 
debuting after Zach Lowther. I was wrong. He it, Bauman is a full year older. Okay. Lowther turns 25 in April. Yeah. Bauman turns 26 in September. Okay. So I'm going Michael Bauman okay. with a not a full 65 year. bird percent There's chance debuting before Zach Lowther. All right. The other thing though, Bauman did pitch has had less experience at the Double A level. This is true. Lowther. Well, that's why I still got 30 on Zach Lowther. I'm hedging my bets. All these numbers are just going in one ear. This is like... We are not recalling any of this. This is the whole GameStop thing. It was just like... Yeah. No idea what's going on. All right. Final one here. Okay. Ryan Mountcastle. Yep. Plays more than 80 games. He wins MVP 100 birds. Oh, sorry. That wasn't the question. Go ahead. No, not the question there, Brendan. If you could, you know, kind of like play by the rules. Yeah, sorry. No, I... I got ahead of myself working is I'm like giving you the scenarios, Uh, not the other way around. Okay. Right? right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh... Ryan Mountcastle plays more than 80 games in left field. Ryan Ooh. Mountcastle plays between 50 and 80 games in left field. Okay. Ryan Mountcastle plays fewer than 50 games in left field. You know this one is tugging at my heartstrings because I have talked about many a time a on this Mass and Orioles podcast that I think Ryan Mountcastle should be a first baseman rather than a left fielder. It's true. However... I do not foresee the Orioles giving up on the Ryan Mountcastle left field experiment because we know that they tried him at third base for approximately 17 years before they finally gave up and decided that that wasn't going to work. Also, I would like to point out, like, we, we've talked so much about him being, like, a, a better first baseman. He's not even a natural first baseman. Right. Like, he's a natural third baseman Well, he got shortstop. drafted as a shortstop. Yeah. yeah. Then moved to first base, right. then to the outfield. So, right. like... Both of them are secondary positions. So Reverse it's not like Trey Mancini a, situation. Yeah. So I, I doubt he plays fewer than 50 in left field, but I think there is a chance if, let's say, Ryan McKenna and Yusniel Diaz both get called up and are playing really well. So I will put 20 birds on Ryan Mountcastle playing fewer than 50 games in left field. Okay. Because I think there is a small chance that he gets moved to a primary first baseman. 50 and 80 is the scenario that I think makes the most sense where he plays a good chunk of games in left field, plays a good chunk at first base, and then also probably plays some games at DH. So I will put, goodness, how many birds can I put there? Let's put, math is hard. Let's put 60 birds there. Between 50 and 80. I'm, I'm only half paying attention. I hope somebody is paying close enough attention so that they could say, just do quick math and say, none of this adds up to 100. Yeah, I think I'm going to put 60 birds there between 50 and 80, which leaves me with 20 birds, again, to say that he plays over 80 games in left field. I think he will probably have a pretty good combination of left field, first base, DH next season. So I think 50 and 80 is the number I'm going with, and I will put 60 birds there. All right. 20 fewer than 50, 60 between 50 and 80, 20 more than 80. If you're still with us, God bless you. (laughs) Uh, Thanks for sticking around here on the Mass and All Access podcast. That ends our game. (laughs) Thank goodness. And that roughly... I was stressed out. Ends the pod... I was stressed out listening to you. Yeah. I mean, never make Brendan do math on the podcast ever again. Look... There's a Next reason I'm bringing in an equation board. There is a reason I was a analytics minor and not an analytics major. Drop that one more time. <laughs> I just I am just flexing my saber metrics. I'm a political science. I was a political science minor and were you really? Couldn't tell you a thing about politics. Not a thing, Brendan. Well. And the thing good is thing this is a sports and, podcast. Even then. less about science. So yeah. I'll tell you. All right. Well, thanks for hopping on uh, the Mass and All Access podcast, which, of course, you can listen to on all your favorite platforms. Please rate, review, subscribe. You don't watch on the reg. Please watch regularly. I'm going to not say on the reg anymore. <laughs> yeah, please never do that again. <laughs> Hated that. Yeah, me too. Also, if you Hated, are... It didn't sound good coming out of my no, mouth. No. It's if like, you, you are... know, didn't look... Ball didn't look good coming out of his hand. Yeah. You know? Also, if you are watching on Facebook or YouTube... Uh, apparently, he is Brendan Mortensen, and I am Paul Mancano. Oh, we have it flipped. We have the lower third flipped. Oh, good. Production value. Yes. Top of notch. Nailed it. Great stuff. Really good. Um, That's all why right. everyone tunes in. Sounds good. Uh, <laughs> thanks for tuning in. Of course, at Brendan Morty is Brendan's Twitter handle. Yeah. I'm at Paul Mancano. We will keep you covered, and we will be back in a week 
after games have started Woo. from spring training, Sarasota, Florida. Probably will have four more inches of snow and eight more inches of ice by that point. Yep. Up in Baltimore. Can't wait. <laughs> Adley Rushman, everybody. Good night. Good night.